I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me. I'd like to thank uh, you guys for sticking, sticking out for the free talks. Um, lost all respect for you. But, uh, I'd also like to, I know it's not the last talk, but I think uh, I would still like to, um, I think Dennis deserves, uh, will deserve two rounds of applause. For, um, and I'd like to thank you, Dennis, for organizing these things. I've done it before. It's like an infinite amount of work that nobody else sees. Um, and uh, we didn't see any hitches, and so it looked like so easy and perfect to us. <laughs> but um, thank you, let's, on behalf of everybody, definitely thank you. So um, today I'm going to give a talk on a different topic than the other. Other days, it's sort of a, in the spirit of what Craig said about being a workshop, this is, uh, I would call it work in progress, except we haven't actually done work. And there's not much progress, no, there's progress in his theorems. But um, um, I gave this as a title like six months ago, thinking like this will inspire me to uh, finish this stuff. But um, anyway, um, hopefully people will can give comments and you know, so I'm, this is sort of a, Work, I will say work in progress. It's, uh, the title is Reconstruction Problems in Geometry and Topology. So I'd like to start out with geometry and where some of the motivation comes from. Um, so let me just like recall, if you have a map from Rn to Rn, phi from Rn to Rn is affine um, if there exists a matrix, an invertible linear transformation in GLNR, let's call it A, and if there exists a vector W in Rn such that um, for all vectors in Rn, phi of the vector, so your composition of a linear transformation and a translation. Okay, the affine maps. And, Affine maps take lines to lines, and they, of course, um, take uh, planes to planes, etc. And what the fundamental theorem of projective geometry, one might call it affine geometry, says, I'm going to state it. Um, there's a projective way to state it, and there's an affine way to state it, and I'm going to state it in the affine way. Is um, it's answering the question: What really is a linear transformation? Or more generally, what is an affine map? And more precisely, what it says, and I couldn't trace this theorem back using Google last night, at least. This must be hundreds of years old. It said, suppose you have a set map from the set of um, subspaces. Oh, when I say subspace, um, maybe I'll say affine subspaces, meaning um, it's not just planes to the origin. It's k planes through any point of Rn, of all dimensions. So lines, planes, three planes, etc. cetera. Um, and you have a bijective correspondence between that thing and itself. Bijection. And suppose, um, so affine maps do this, but of course, this, you can have anything can be bijection. And suppose that, um, if you have P1 and P2 affine subspaces, then P1 is contained in P2 if and only if phi of P1 is contained in phi of P2. In other words, it's just an abstract map of the set of subspaces preserving this kind of partial ordering of inclusion. Right? That's a key thing. Then phi is induced by a, of course, unique affine map. This answers the question, what is an affine map? And by induced by an affine map, I just mean there's some affine map little phi so that it induces this bijection. OK, so this is a classical, beautiful theorem. It has lots of applications in mathematics. Just to give one, when you try to prove Mostow rigidity about uh, rigidity of lattices and discrete subgroups of semi-simple Lie groups, which seems like far away from this. Um, 
Literally, this theorem, I mean, most people have seen, a lot of people have seen the proof for the real hyperbolic case, but in higher rank, which is sort of an even more important case, um, for lattices and SLNR, this is a key ingredient in the proof. Just as a little teaser there, I'm not going to get into that. Okay, so I wanted to start today, I just started to think about this theorem. I was sort of reminded, I forget why, by the, this theorem, and I just started to try to um, think about it myself and uh, make it my own. And um, I came up with a variation. Um, so let me state the theorem. Um, suppose I thought, what if you don't have inclusions of planes and stuff? Of course, this is just a bijection from an uncountable set to itself. But suppose phi is a bijection from the set of lines. What can you do with lines? It's a set map that's a bijection. And suppose, um, let me state it this way. Uh, let me do the n equals 2 case. <laughs> so this theorem, uh, this theorem is n greater than or equal to 3 because there's nothing to say in R2. In R2, it's just you have lines. They're contained in the whole subspace. But, so it's only really for n greater than or equal to 3. So let me state the n equals 2 case, and there's going to be a, Yes? Do your affine subspaces include points? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, of dimension. You don't, so yeah, this is a key point. This is a much easier theorem, yes, of affine of dimension greater than zero. Thank you. It's a much easier theorem, which is an exercise for you to prove that if I start out with a bijective set map from Rn to itself, and it takes lines to lines, no other conditions. This is due to Darboux in the 1800s. Then you're affine. That's much easier. See, this is just, you don't even have a map of this R end of itself. Yeah, and I'll get back to that later. Thank you. Set of lines in R end to itself. And suppose, let me, I'm just stating it for n equals 2. There's a higher dimensional version. Let's just concentrate on this. Suppose for all distinct lines, L1, L2, L3, if, uh, that you preserve triple intersections. If three lines intersect, then uh, that's if and only if the three corresponding lines intersect. Then phi is that fine. A uh, phi is induced by an affine map. And in R3, you need four lines, four tuple intersections. Yes? So for n equals 2, then, we've got a of lines. Isn't that the same as? Sorry. No, this theorem, there's no theorem here for n equals 2. But it's not true for n equals 2. Yeah, this theorem, for n equals 2, this is false, because just you have a bijection of lines. There's no other condition. Yeah, so, so but my thing has a two-dimensional version. OK? And then the three-dimensional vert, like I said, you need four tuple, four intersection points. So this is the key. And um, let me just make a few remarks. Um, yeah, there's the Rn version. But a remark is that this is false if phi is only assumed to preserve double points. This is sort of preserving triple points. And let me give you the example. So you might say, why are you looking at three lines? Why not just say two things intersect definitely if they uh, intersect? Oh, I guess that's, um, yeah. Let me just point out, if you take R2 and then just take a strip of vertical lines in R2, OK? Take a homeomorphism of the interval, let's say homeo plus of 0, 1, and then on this strip do sort of if this is 0 and this is 1, do f cross the identity. Take any old crazy homeomorphism. That actually, that actually gives me a bijective set map of the space, right? It gives me a homeomorphism of Rn. I do the identity out here, an identity over here. Um, and it takes lines to lines, right? Um, no, sorry. I'm going to give you, sorry. I'm going to give you, sorry. 
But it does, I'm going to give you a bijection of lines. Sorry, let me give you a bijection on the set of lines to itself. Ready? All lines go to themselves, except for these vertical ones. And then I just take the permutation on this, this set of vertical lines. Okay, I'm like declaring that to be my bijection. That is a bijection. Um, and what's the point? Oh, that bijection is not induced. Oh, and it satisfies my, uh, the property of two things intersect if and only if their images intersect. Because look, if some line intersects, obviously if things don't interact with this, you're fine. And if you have something crossing and it intersects this line, it's still going to intersect the image. But this is not a linear map. This is not affine. <laughs> obviously. It can be. So you need triple intersections. And we're going to see where does that come in? What's the key thing? It's really funny because I didn't know the key thing. I first tried to prove this, came up with a counterexample, and it turns out that the key is a theorem that I, um, I actually had read, <laughs> I, I had worked on and uh, knew, and it was really uh, fun. And I want to say, oh, we're not starting with a map from Rn to Rn. Just like, so let me just give the two-line proof, or the, the proof. proof. Step one is to uh, construct a bijection from R2 to R2 inducing phi, meaning this bijection will take lines to lines, take lines to lines. And then two, Darbu proved in the 1800s Actually, I think I have a kind of a more sort of Thurstonian proof of this, but um, I don't have time to do this. I want to move to the topology part of the talk. Darboon in the 1800 said if phi going from Rn to Rn takes lines to lines, oh, takes lines to lines, um, and is bijective. So a bijective set map of Rn to Rn taking lines to lines, then phi is at phi, dead on at phi. It's a beautiful characterization of, in fact, classically, of course, this shows how old this is. Probably many of you think that this is the definition of at phi, taking lines to lines. Right, but then, um, of course, if you take lines to lines, then you're of this form. That's trivial. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> No, that's our view. Sorry. OK, so all I need to do is to construct a set map that's the right candidate. And that takes lines to lines. And here's what you do. Let me just, uh, so I just need to do the proof of one. So any questions? You should try to prove Darboux's theorem. It's really fun. You can do it. It's really fun. Proof of one. So I need to define a map from R2 to R2. So like. What am I going to do? Like, and it's take lines times. Well, look. If I have a point, I will just take these two lines, L1 and L2, map them over via phi. I get phi of L1 and phi of L2. They'll intersect because, um, oh, I didn't prove intersections are preserved. Well, suppose you knew that like, just intersecting is preserved. So you can prove pretty easily that yeah, it's clear that if two things intersect, then their images have to intersect, because this is true of triple points. So if two things intersect, the image has to intersect. Let's say, given a point P, I create the lines L1 and L2. I see where they go. They intersect, because I'm assuming intersections are preserved, or it follows trivially from the assumptions of the theorem, from this, that the intersection of two lines, if two lines intersect, so parallelism is preserved. And then, shouldn't this be phi of P? Right? Obviously, it's going to have to do that. But here's the problem with this definition. You need to show well-defined. In other words, you need to show, so suppose instead of choosing L1 and L2, you chose two different lines intersecting this point. Well, let's just change one of them. Let's make it L3. Right? Well, I know L3 has to intersect L2, and L3 has to intersect L1. So what if it was like this? <laughs> Which of these points would you uh, 
defined. You see the problem? You need all three to intersect. And so you need some assumption here. And my, the assumption is that um, triple intersections go to triple intersections. And um, sorry, let me just think for one moment. Sorry, this doesn't just immediately do it. it uh, yes, yes. Now I'm seeing. Um, OK. Sorry, I realize I maybe should have done the higher dimensional theorem. The, one of the punch lines is supposed to be Helly's theorem. You guys know Helly's theorem in like 1913? If you have like n plus 2, sorry, if you have a collection of convex sets in Rn, any n plus 1 of which intersect, they all intersect. So like if you have three convex sets, here's lines, but if they all intersect, then, um, sorry, if any, it's not true if any two intersect, then they all intersect, right? But if any three lines, any three convex sets in R2 intersect, you have a collection of sets, convex sets, any three of which intersect, then they all intersect. So I'm slightly, yeah. But I, I do actually want to move on because the topology thing is the main thing. Sorry, good. So I'm saved by my own, uh, yeah, anyway. Or maybe not saved. <laughs> so let me talk about topology though. This was sort of a motivation and like uh, messing around with variations on the fundamental theorem of projective geometry. There's actually lots of variations you can do on this and look at other spaces other than Rn. But let me talk about topology. And this part is joint with Dan Margulate, who's at Georgia Tech. So we wanted to answer the question. So um, as you all know, there's a whole, whole study of you know, classical study going back you know, 80 years or something of the char char characterizing manifolds topologically. And um, so you're asking, like, what is a manifold? And so um, we wanted to ask, you know, what is a homeomorphism? How do you characterize homeomorphisms? And what do I mean by that? So let me just say the theorems we proved. That we're inspired by the, fun uh, these are nonlinear version of the fundamental theorem of projective geometry. So I'm going to give you two theorems, but these are two of, like, many, many things one could do in topology. You want to go through topology and understand what really is a covering map? What really is a homotopy equivalence, et cetera, et cetera? So I want to answer, what is a homeomorphism? So fix a manifold M. I think I just probably want connected, but I'm not going to worry about hypotheses too much. So I want to look at the space of embedded spheres, embeddings, topological embeddings of S n minus 1 in M. But I want to look at just the subsets. I don't want to look at them as maps. And so how you do that is you, you mod out by diff Sn minus 1. And this is just the set of sort of subsets of the topological space M homeomorphic to Sn minus 1. Just like spheres in there. It's this, whatever interpretation you want to give. And um, great. So theorem 1. Um, so if you have a homeomorphism of M, this is an N-manifold, sorry, an N-manifold. So we're looking at co-dimension one spheres. We started out with just like loops, embedded circles on a surface. N greater than or equal to, let me do N greater than or equal to two, I haven't thought about N equals one. Um, what does a homeomorphism do? I mean, a homeomorphism does take like embedded spheres to embedded spheres. So suppose phi just is a bijective set map. Again, I want to emphasize, we don't have a map of the manifold. We just have a bijective set map from the set of all spheres in it, topological spheres. Bijective. And um, of course, that's just a bijection between two uncountable sets. And then you need to say, well, what is the real property that a homeomorphism is doing? And there's lots of things you could try to do. Let me just say one of them. And suppose. For all sphere, uh, embedded spheres, I'm thinking of the subsets, <laughs> x and y, embedded spheres, you have the property of just disjointness is preserved. 
x and y, uh, you can either say disjoint or not disjoint. It's equivalent. They're disjoint if and only if phi of x is disjoint from phi of y. So are these smooth and vagues of spheres? No, just topological. Probably we want locally flat. I haven't, we haven't written down like all the details of the proof. This is what's really, uh, you know, when I was joking in the beginning and that this is a workshop, it's really like we haven't written down all the details, but locally flat is probably, probably same. Although I think, um, no, actually, I'm sorry, I want topological. I think that's fine. It's just all topological embeddings. Oh, yes, thank you. Oh, you're secretly, uh, yeah, I secretly do this and then see where I use diff because I never think of, yeah, good, thank you. Mining up by home, yeah? And suppose you preserve the property of disjointness, then there's a unique uh, diff homeomorphism of the manifold to itself inducing phi, which just means the permutation. When you have a homeomorphism manifold to itself, it like just permutes the set of all embedded spheres. And like, I'm just saying that this homeomorphism induces the given one. So this is like the fundamental theorem of projective geometry. And I think it's one answer to like, what is a homeomorphism? Um, let me just say uh, one thing where you're really, this is really a manifold thing. Um, you might ask, how general can you make this? And so let me just say um, the following. This is not true replacing M by I'll call it Z. So do the following. Take two disks. Oh, yeah. Doesn't matter. D1 and D2 that touch at two points. So the union of two disks, disjoint union, except they, uh, you glue them together at two points, P and Q. OK. Then there exists a bijective set map from also, in this case, it's like two dimensions, so like loops. When I say loops, I mean like embedded circles. Loops in Z to itself, that's bijective, <laughs> preserves um, preserves disjointness. But is not induced by any homeomorphism. In fact, I think by any even, well, anyway, induced by any homeo. This can probably be generalized. But. And here's what you do. What you do is you take a, uh, something that flips D2. Take an F, take a homeomorphism of, D, of the second disk uh, that squares to the identity and that takes, uh, flips P and Q. So this flips this. I claim this map gives me a sort of natural bijection between the set of loops. Why? Because, look, if you're a loop, there's three possibilities. You're a loop, you either lie on this side, and you do the identity on this side, and you do f on this side. So if you're a loop, you're either on this side, this side, or a third case. If you're on this side, of course, the loop goes to itself, so the bijection is the identity, you know, from the is. If you're on this side, this loop goes to this loop, right? It's a homeomorphism induces a bijection. The other option is that any other loop, it's just an arc on this side, union and arc on this side. And so any such loop, there's like a natural bijection with them. Um, you take this part, and then it's the image. It gives me the same loop, actually. So you're the identity. Actually, you leave invariant every, uh, not, you don't leave invariant every loop. But, halfway around the boundary on each side? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's one loop. And then go straight across. Oh, then here? Go back. Yes. And then, and then do something on the, do the same thing on the other side. On both sides. Yeah. And those two things. Sorry. Oh, is this not a counterexample? No. Well, this is why this is good. It's a workshop. But no, <laughs> uh, you're saying go like that, and then there, and like that, and then there. Um, sorry, I flipped this. Yeah, it's still a simple closed it curve. It isn't fixed. Oh, sorry, it's not fixed. It just it gives a byte. Well, uh, no, there's two simple closed curves, and, and, and you want one on each side. 
Oh wait, where are the simple closed curves? Are you including this or no? Oh, you're taking two simple closed curves. One on each side, I'm just meeting in one point. They kiss at that point. Um, oh, um, oh, I see. I'm sorry. This doesn't, this doesn't preserve the, the intersection. Doesn't preserve. Um, yeah, so you're saying take a closed curve here and a closed curve here. And it doesn't preserve the intersection. This doesn't preserve the intersection. No, nope, that's true. This is like a really stupid. So much for that conversation. Yes. Okay. So we can prove that too. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, it's hard to believe you could do this in super generality, but okay. Thank you. It was what, like I said, we're you know. Um. Okay. Yeah. Let me just leave that because I think there's some variation of the. There, sorry, there's definitely an example that works. You could do it for finite graphs. It's just not as interesting as this. It's an exercise to give counterexamples to this theorem. For this. You can build graphs because you just know all the simple closed curves on a finite graph. And so you can like, make the theorem false for finite graphs. But it's not as exciting a counterexample. But it's true. It has, I guess it has the advantage of working. In the theorem, are the manifolds allowed to have boundaries? Um, no, I don't know if it's false or we just didn't think about it. And let me just say what theorem two is, and there's probably a generalization of this, but we only thought about this one so far. So uh, let phi, it's just about the manifold R3. What is the homeomorphism of R3? And we wanted to do it instead of codimension one using codimension two objects. Suppose you have a bijective set map from the set of loops in R3, by which I mean um, subsets homeomorphic to a circle. Uh, and not intersecting itself, yes. Simple closed curves. Uh, suppose you have a set map from the set of simple closed curves in R3 to itself that's bijective. And suppose, so you need some property here. Suppose phi preserves linking, meaning just linking or not. So meaning that gamma 1 links gamma 2. That just means it has non-zero linking number. If and only if phi of gamma 1 links phi of gamma 2. So that seemed like a basic, you know, we guessed that because that seemed like a basic topological property. Suppose you have that property. Then phi is induced by a unique homeomorphism. From R3 to R3. Of course, any homeomorphism in R from R3 to R3 preserves linking. No. So that's a good question. We prove, you can prove that. But we're not assuming you preserve disjointness, but we're saying that if two things intersect, they don't link. And we're defining that to be not linked. So, yes. And then you can use that to show that disjointness is. So any two things link, right? Even if they kind of link somewhere over, over here, that intersects over there. Yeah. So let me give the proof idea, proof sketch, proof outline maybe, of theorem one. Um, oh, where's theorem one? I, did I really erase it? Did I really do that? Um, sorry. Please burn this videotape. Um, let me give the theorem over here. I like to have the theorem always in sight. So you start, the, so the input, here's the theorem one. Input, so S is a set of Sn minus ones in M. And the input is a bijection from S to S. Bijection 
preserving disjointness. And the conclusion, we have to construct a homeomorphism from Rn to Rn inducing phi. And I'll tell you right now, it's all completely elementary. There's no, um, oh, m to m, yes. Oh, yeah, that would be quite a theorem there. But, um, thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I thought it would be good, too, to talk about this in front of this crowd, because just like with other things, like, you know, so this is totally elementary, but, you know, input of machinery that people have been thinking about for a long time can probably often soup things up a lot. So I hope to uh, inspire your comments um, to, uh, to help us out here. Um, yeah, so it's really elementary, but it's many, many sort of uh, frontline battles, little battles. Um, OK, so let me give the sketch of the proof here. So we start, uh, what time do we start at? 9.30. Uh, 9.30, okay. OK, great. So it's useful to encode this disjointness and stuff. So let gamma sub n be the, a graph, an abstract graph, with vertices corresponding to um, embedded spheres. And you connect two spheres if they are dis, uh, disjoint. Um, that corresponds to x intersect y is the empty set, right? And so what we're given, we're given, if you think about phi, it's exactly the conditions on the theorem are just that you're an automorphism of this graph. And we want to show, and our goal, yeah, the goal is to show that the automorphisms of this graph the group of automorphisms of this ridiculously huge graph is precisely the group of homeomorphisms of the manifold. That's a restatement of the, maybe I should have called this restatement of theorem, but. Okay, so let's start out. What I'm gonna do, since it's all sort of elementary and hands-on, <clears throat> I think the most useful thing is to sort of give you the steps, give you some of the ideas, and then just Indicate what some of the issues are, like where things can go wrong from your intuition. Could theoretically go wrong from intuition. Sort of where you have to do some a uh, little more work. So step one, I'm just going to do it in steps here. Step one is that, um, so I first want to just characterize, I mean, probably people here can guess, but you, you at least want to start looking at like separation properties and nesting properties. I was driving over with Bob Daverman and told him the theorem and he like guessed the, <laughs> not the pattern, <laughs> maybe he knew the whole proof, but, it, but I, he, he said, oh, you, you must have to start doing separation properties and that's exactly right. So, so a sphere in M is separating. So X is an element of, you know, dimension one sphere, is separating if and only if if you look at the link in the graph gamma m of x, so if and only if it's a join. Okay, and the proof, let me just give the proof idea. This direction is absolutely clear. Um, I'm gonna, let me draw two dimensional schematics. If here's your sphere, x, so you think of that as a vertex in the graph. What's the link of a vertex? It's all the guys that are disjoint from x. And of course, the set of things disjoint from x come in like two groups, things on the inside and things on the outside, since x is separating. I'm using x as separating there. And um, everything on the inside is disjoint from everything on the outside. So there's an edge between them in that graph. So you're a join. That's what a join is. You take two sets, and it's all the edges between all the, yeah. So um, that is clear. 
And the other way, this is also quite easy, but let me just do it. Suppose the link is a join. So I like this because basically what we do is the following. I mean, These kind of reconstruction problems where you're like reconstructing a homeomorphism from properties, you start like listing things that are true and you try to prove them, easy things, and you list more and more things and you build like a dictionary between topological properties in the manifold and properties of your graph. This is actually what you do in, um, in the work of, um, of Tietz, on Tietz buildings, and automorphism groups of Tietz buildings. Those are generalizations of the fundamental theorem of projective geometry. And you do this thing where you slowly build up properties of an affine map. Um, so um, suppose the link is a join. So let join of A1 and A2, let Yi be an AI. Just pick any spheres. Secretly, we're thinking of them. On the, we want them to be on the inside and the outside. I just need to show that my thing separates. So I need to show that there are two guys where there's no path between them. Right? So these are two spheres, y1 and y2. So how am I going to come up with like two, two things that can't be connected, um, two different components of my manifold? Well, the link is a join. I take one thing from each. And if, suppose, um, what do I want to suppose? Um, suppose m minus x is connected. So, so you're not separating. Well, then there exists a path gamma from y1 to y2. And then you could look at let z be the neighborhood of gamma. And then boundary z will be um, will be a sphere. So let me draw it. This is the boundary of the tubular neighborhood of gamma. And so there's already a contradiction because um, why is there a contradiction? Oh, these are in the link. So y1 and y2. Uh, Um, boundary Z intersects Y1, so boundary Z is not in A2 because it intersects Y1, and boundary Z is not in A1 because it intersects Y2, so it's not in either piece of the link. Because if I was in A1, everything in A1 intersects everything in A2. I mean, it's disjoint from everything in A2. But boundary Z um, is disjoint from X, because you can make it disjoint from, so yeah, where's X in this picture? Oh yeah, all these were on the same component. X is like down here. These are all in some component. You know, it's connected. M minus X is connected. So you can make all this disjoint from X. And then, so boundary Z intersects X is empty. So you're in the link, but you're not in A1 or A2. So boundary Z is in the link of X. So boundary Z, in fact, boundary Z is in the link of X, but not in, but boundary Z is not in the join of A1 and A2. So that's a contradiction. OK. Questions? So you just sort of do the same thing. So now what is the strategy? We now know separating goes to separating. So it feels pretty good because what's topology on a manifold? What's a homeomorphism? You know, you're taking open sets to open sets. And this is good because you're taking spheres to spheres. But you, you definitely need more. I mean, there are things that could, a lot of things that could possibly happen. Um, so for example, uh, you know, sort of phi remembers 
between. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you have three spheres, we now have, uh, let's take separate spheres that separate. I'm concentrating on elements of S that are separating in the manifold. Um, it doesn't make sense to be inside or outside of something separating. But it does make sense for three things to have a relative ordering. And so if you had x y, and sort of z, y is between x and z. And between makes sense. So for example, you could, again, this is the game. You want to phrase all properties in terms of disjointness of spheres. And so like y is between x and z, you say that you could prove like y is between x and z in the sense that we all know it in topology, the word between. If and only if every, every sphere that intersects, I'm allowed to use the word intersecting, right? If I, if I can phrase a topological property in terms of co-dimension one spheres and intersecting and things that we previously proved or preserved, like separating, just purely in terms of that, then of course any automorphism of the graph preserves that, any automorphism. So more and more time. And so this topological property is preserved because y is between x and z if and only if any sphere that intersects both x and z has to intersect y. So like that's obviously preserved. OK. But let me get to some more interesting. So now what we do, this is where it gets a little, um, you know, you have to be a little careful. But again, everything is elementary. Um, step three is um, you look at embedded isotopies. So the next little thing is preserved. An embedded isotopy is the following. It's a map. Let's call it um, uh, H going from 0, 1. Remember, this space has a topology. It's the space of subsets of a topological space. Where it's a space of embeddings, which has the compact open topology of this n minus 1 sphere of the manifold. And then you get the quotient topology for modding out by homeo. So this has a topology. So an embedded isotopy is a map such that each, I'll call them h sub t, meaning h of t, is embedded. Oh, it's more than that. Sorry. And sort of uh, the union of all the h of t's. They're all embeddings of spheres. So look at the subset, which is, sorry, the way we say that is we say that's a product, um, if you know what I mean. Uh, I don't like terminology. Yes, I'll say this, fine. This is a correct thing to say. This is embedded, an embedded annulus, uh, an embedded Sn minus 1 cross 0, 1. So, all this is, it's just a family in intervals worth of um, embeddings of spheres, OK? But, but it comes with a preferred uh, foliation by co-dimension one spheres. So you want to show those are preserved. So somehow you can detect a little bit now moving around a little bit with spheres. Now this is where um, things can happen. So you want to characterize embedded isotopies purely in terms of intersections with other spheres or not. So let me just say what the, do I have time to, uh, yeah, let me just, uh, let me just say what the properties is. You characterize, the key is characterize, characterization of embedded isotopy in terms of uh, you can think of it as, again, graph theoretic properties, a lemma. That's called, it, this is sort of the title of the lemma. So just take a one parameter family. There's no, no, just a set map. I guess I want it to be injective. So I have a countable, uncountable collection of loops, that's it. I'm parameterizing them like this, but it's just a set map. And I want to know when is it like continuous and everything's embedded. And I have to say that in terms of disjointness. So it's fine. You like mess around for, you know, you, you struggle to find what it is. But once I can say it, the proof that embedded isotopy phi sort of 
gives a correspondence from embedded isotopies to embedded isotopies. In other words, if I start like a, with a family of this, then I hit it with my, remember, I'm given a bijection of spheres to spheres that preserves this jointness. And I want to show, if I like look what happens to a family of spheres like this, its images, which a priori are random, I know they're disjoint from each other, but their images also look like this. That's what I'm trying to do. And if I can do that in terms of that property, in terms of the graph theoretic property, then of course you're preserved by an automorphism. So once you have this characterization, the proof that you take pictures like this to pictures like this, um, that families go to families, is one line. But of course you have to write this. So the four properties are uh, disjointness. Of course you need your family to um, um, H of R intersect H of S is empty, is not empty, if and only if R equals S. The second key property, so I'm trying to understand now, what is the property of a foliated annulus? As opposed to just any old union of spheres. That's what I'm trying to write down. Well, all the spheres, you know, here's a one parameter family of spheres. Well, they better be disjoint. You better have order preserving. In other words, if you have R less than S less than T, then H of R is uh, not contained in, but is inside. Sorry, sorry, H of S is between. You better preserve the betweenness. That's like a key property of an annulus. Is between H of R and H of T. The third thing is no gaps. I mean, here's a one parameter family of spheres. Just take the sphere across the interval and like pluck out the sphere across a half. Just take it out. That satisfies everything so far. Like I want to show there's like not a gap there. Right? So how do you, you want to detect that there's no gaps. And that means um, or no gaps. So there exists a curve gamma. I'm oh, sorry, there does not uh, Yes, there does not exist any gamma, any, cur any um, sphere disjoint from, so there's the picture I just said. The problem is you have these pictures in your head, and you're like, yeah, it has this property, but then you have to get the right properties and prove an abstract theorem. You know, you can't like look at any pictures because you don't know what it actually looks like. So that's sort of the problem. But anyway, um, there's no gaps. That means there's no sphere disjoint from all the HT between H of 0 that's in, in the annulus, H of 0 and H of 1. By the way, everything I've written so far is in terms of the original graph theoretic property, just the property of disjointness and things I've proven follow from disjointness. So I just use the word disjoint. This follows from disjointness as I previously proved. Between follows from disjointness. So, so this is that no gaps. And then finally, uh, the continuity. So you want to somehow say they're varying continuously and in terms of disjointness. And here's how you do it. See, I'm secretly, let me just point out, uh, yeah, here I'm, I'm using not just the curves in the family. I'm now using all cur all, sorry, I keep saying curves. I'm using all spheres in the manifold now. I have to go outside this family. I sort of can't detect continuity just by using the things themselves. So for all spheres, uh, S, if you look at the set of times, so here's the picture. You have this like foliation by spheres. So how do I show that it varies continuously just using other spheres as detectors? Well, here's a picture. If I have a sphere, let, here's a sphere. Somehow there's like a time at which like it stops hitting these guys. You know, I'm sort of probing in there with the sphere. And so here's the property, it turns out, that works. You look at the set of times, so this is t time equal to like uh, zero, or so let's say t equals one and t, t equals zero is in here. The set of times such that uh, this is h of t. 
h of t intersect gamma is not empty is closed in 0, 1. So suppose you have, I just wrote down four properties of a honest to God real life annulus. So closed interval or just closed? Just a closed set. It doesn't have to be closed interval because there are weird, th you know, you could, my sphere could be really windy. And, yeah. um, the conclusion of all of this is then H is an embedded isotopic. I mean, if and only if, of course. And so the immediate corollary to this is sort of phi of a, like embedded isotopy equals an embedded isotopy. OK. I mean, I'm not going to prove this, but you just get, get in there, man, and you know. Yeah. Like I said, this is sort of element. I mean, I think once I give you this, you could get in there and like everybody, I mean, it's topologist here, so everybody could prove these statements by messing around. OK. And then, so that was step uh, three. OK. Um, step four is just, you sort of, um, let me just say this. Um, you show that um, if you have a punctured disk, punctured disk with foliation, I don't know what to call it. I'll say a, uh, an isotopy, uh, we, we haven't, don't have terms for this. If you have a, um, let me just say a punctured, a foliated, I'll put it in quotes, punctured, and I'll just give you the picture, you'll know what I mean. Disc, and you hit it with phi, that takes you to a foliated, punctured disc. So let me say what I mean precisely by this. It's, it's in like an open-ended isotopy. It's not a, from a closed interval. It's like interval from like 0 to infinity. And you're just missing this point. It foliates the complement. Let's say b minus x, and this is x, and it's just a family of spheres like this. I like literally can create this, right? I'm in my manifold. If you give me a point, I can like create a little family of spheres like this, and they're all separating. I can hit them with my bijective correspondence. It's some random thing. But I've shown you, at least if you cut off at any finite time, it's um, it looks like it should look if you were homeomorphism. And so like b minus x, and then the claim is you hit this with phi, and that you're going to get some collection, but it's going to limit down to a single point, And that'll be homeomorphic to b minus y. Now clearly, clearly, if you look at one thing that's clear, so this is not as easy as it looks. So one thing that is easy is like you can start stacking these things on top of each other to get like open-ended isotope, you know. But what could happen? So one thing, the clear part is, so this is phi. If this family is called h sub t, where t goes from like 0 to like infinity or something, you know, open. So it's like coming down to this point. Clearly, if you then look at this family of spheres, um, this family of spheres, um, it only has one component that supports simple close, that supports um, embedded spheres. Um, the has only one component. In other words, supporting a um, component in the complement. Sorry, let me just say what's clear and draw the pictures because it's more useful for you and easier for me. More importantly, it's easier for me. So in other words, you have this family, you have a point x, and you have a family of spheres limiting down onto x. I map it all over. So what can't happen, clearly, is that you have a family of spheres, it limits down, and it somehow limits to some specific sphere. And that's it. And you miss all of this. That clearly can't happen because you're not preserving the property like there's a little tiny sphere in here that's disjoint from all of these. And that doesn't happen. You know, you have bijective correspondence. So that's not a problem. So you're like, oh, yeah, I have to limit down to a point. So it can't happen. But why can't you do this? You could limit down 
for example, to a tree. So this family of spheres could map to a family of spheres that's <laughs> limiting down to this tree. You see what I mean? And so they limit down to something that sort of doesn't have any spheres in it. So we can't see it. We can only see things that sort of contains it. So you have to roll that out, must roll out. Of course, you do this with like other spheres that aren't part of the family and all this stuff. And so it's not, but, but I'm just saying that's a thing that can go wrong. But now let me tell you why we're done. Uh, this is perfect. Let me just tell you why we're done. Because, so step um, five, I'm now going to give you a homeomorphism. Step five is define a homeomorphism from the manifold to itself via the following recipe. If you give me x, you just give an x, you pick a family h sub t of guys, um, what did I call it, a foliated punctured disk, sort of limiting down to x. These are h sub t's, and I map this over, and this goes to a foliated punctured disk. Uh, so this is like a ball minus x, and this goes to some b prime minus y, and I just set x to y. Right? Sounds good. And if, if you're a homeo, you better be this. But why is this well defined? So, right, what if I pick, I, there's infinitely many, uncountably many families of h sub t's going down to this. But see, if, uh, if you pick another family, then we're co-final in each other. And so, um, and so what? Oh, and so if I limited down to some, if I also limited down to this, oh, sorry, if I, if I you know, Rick picks a family h prime of t, it's limiting down to something. If it limits down to something over here, like I can eventually detect that by separation properties. So like, you're just well defined, and like, then you prove it to homeo. I mean, ready, you're continuous, that's no big surprise. Now you have like balls, balls, separation properties, you're continuous, then you apply the argument to the inverse. So now you're a homeomorphism, but there's one final thing to um, check. How do you know we, we sort of thought we were done, and then we realized, oh, yeah, we're supposed to prove um, this does nothing. I could have given you a homeomorphism. I could have picked a random homeomorphism that's also homeo. What does this have to do with anything? Um, the point is that phi in patch would do Phi, and we sort of like constructed it like that on all these families, but like you have to do that induce is phi. You have to check every embedded sphere. How do you know it does the same thing to every single embedded sphere? We now have like a set map, and it sort of does the right thing on families shrinking down to the points. So what if I just have now a sphere, and I hit it with phi? I can do two things. I can hit it with phi, and I can hit it with phi. And I'll just say, all you do is this little trick where you Say, oh, ready? I'm going to characterize purely in the graph this specific sphere x. And then phi will preserve that, but also um, phi preserves that too, of course. Phi doesn't, and homeomorphism doesn't group, it induce a graph automorphism. You just want to show they're the same graph automorphism. That's the point. That's what we're trying to do. And the point is, at each point, you, at every single point, you create a family of things <laughs> with separation properties. And so each family goes to something. This curve, it's sort of named by this uncountable collection of families of shrinking isotopies. Sorry, I know that's a little, um, a lot to, but that's the idea. You take these little, you sort of are using families of spheres now as like sort of detectors of exactly where things are. So anyway, that's how you do this. Um, linking is really fun. Linking is a different thing. This thing about linking. This, this theorem two, which I'll just end with with the last uh, 30 seconds. Theorem two proof, I mean, it's a whole different thing. That's the thing that if you have the homeomorphism of R3, 
takes loops to loop. Sorry. You have a bijective map on the set of loops in R3 to the set of loops in R3, and it preserves linking, then you're induced by a homeomorphism. So it's enough to show like spheres go to spheres and then quote this theorem. At least that'll produce a homeomorphism. So, um, but you don't get separation properties or anything anymore because you just have co-dimension, you know. And one thing, I just want to say one trick in that. So you sort of take punctured spheres. So you do have foliations by spheres, so by loops. Given a sphere in R3, you can foliate it in many ways. Uh, foliate the complement of the north and south pole by loops. And I mean, there's more work, but let me just tell you, notice a property of that specific family is that, yeah, it has something linking everything, right? There's one, and any two loops that link this family have to intersect each other. Of course, you have to say, uh, be able to detect intersecting, which is you sort of build up and try to do that. Um, anyway, and between this properties, you can sort of detect with linking because you have like a sphere and then maybe with two, two holes in it. And then inside of it, there's two possible things. There's sort of a, a thing with two holes and a thing with two holes versus hole, 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 hole. And of course, you can characterize in terms of linking this configuration versus this because here, if you link this one and this one, you link, you know. Anyway, you can do stuff in terms of linking. But anyway, um, I think there's a lot of other variations, symplectomorphisms, and try to, like, what is a symplectomorphism? What is a covering map? And just go through uh, Moncrie's book, look at all the um, <laughs> maps, and say, what is? And uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for listening. <laughs>